Okay, perfect. Well, um, <clears throat> well, like Dr. Bray said, I'm um, Benjamin Wilson. I'm uh, one of the, the new staff members at uh, the University of Kentucky, both in, at, at uh, the Department of Sports Medicine, but also the Shriners Hospital here in Lexington. Um, and uh, Dr. Bray here has tasked me with uh, um, a little education on pediatric ACL injuries. Um, so before we get started, I don't have any uh, financial relationships to disclose, but uh, as we'll get into it later, one significant disclosure is um, that you can see my shiny bald head here back in the uh, picture of all of us from Boston Children's Hospital here at the most recent uh, PRISM Society meeting. Um, so that may uh, may skew my opinion, skew my uh, uh, algorithm for how we treat these a little bit. Um, before we get started, I did want to present a few cases um, to kind of frame our discussion as we go along. Um, so these are all hypothetical patients that you may see in your clinic on, on Monday. So our first one is uh, this uh, little eight-year-old girl playing soccer goes down trying to, uh, uh, to juke a defender with a twisting injury in her knee, comes with you with a big effusion and x-rays that look like this. Um, our second patient, uh, next patient of the morning, a 10-year-old male now, uh, got caught in a rundown playing Little League Baseball um, over the weekend. Uh, again, kind of an awkward fall, twist, pop, and his x-rays look like this. Next patient, our 14-year-old uh, male, uh, coming in after a high school um, uh, football game on Friday night. Um, uh, nice, nice play. The quarterback number two here breaks a long touchdown and everybody looks back at number 69 over here is on the, on the turf, holding his knee, comes it into you with a limp and a big effusion and x-rays that look like this. And in case number four is our 16 year old female basketball player goes up for a, a layup, gets bumped while she's in the air, comes down awkwardly, pop in pain, can't continue playing and x-rays that look like this. So, um, so I know you're, you're all thinking what we have here are four uh, pediatric ACL injuries, and I hope that uh, by, the, uh, by the end of the lecture today, we'll, we'll be able to demonstrate that, number one, not all, not all of these patients are the same, uh, just like not all of our pediatric patients are the same, and not all of these should be treated uh, the same way either. So it's important to keep a, a, an open mind and, and uh, keep your um, skills up with various uh, skills for treating these pediatric ACL injuries. So a little bit of background first on uh, on our ACL injuries. Why are we talking about this today? Well, whether whether we like it or not, unfortunately, that we continue to see these ACL injuries in in children. Um, a majority of the patients that present to our clinics with uh, acute hemarthrosis of the knee are uh, are found to have ACL tears. And despite our uh, the increased negative press on sports specialization, overuse injuries, um, and in spite of uh, uh, ACL prevention programs, the incidence of ACL injuries in kids is still continuing to increase. And not only increasing in absolute terms, but also increasing uh, relative to other age groups of ACL injuries and, rel uh, and increasing relative to other pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeries. Um, in fact, uh, in a recent survey of the Herodicus and ACL study groups, uh, these are groups of adult um, surgeons who, who uh, focus on ACLs up to uh, almost 80% of them admitted to, um, to performing a reconstruction on a skeletally immature patient within the last year. So what's the, the difference between our adult patients and our pediatric patients? Well, it all comes down to our uh, sometimes friends, sometimes nemesis in pediatric orthopedics, the physis. Um, this uh, beautiful structure here that you can see evolving over time, which allows the, the uh, adolescent or child to, uh, to continue growing and reshaping their skeleton over time. Uh, we won't get into the nitty-gritty, but it's a, a complex structure at the ends of the long bones that allow for both longitudinal growth, but also appositional growth. Uh, the, with the, when it comes to ACL injuries, we worry about the ones uh, around the knee. Uh, that is the distal, uh, the distal femoral physis and the proximal tibial physis. You can see they contribute to a significant majority of the uh, longitudinal growth of the, uh, of the lower extremity over time. Uh, when it comes to our uh, uh, adolescents or uh, those patients that are nearing uh, skeletal maturity, they really go through two phases uh, of uh, um, growth acceleration. First phase, um, uh, here you can see females aged 11 to 13, males uh, aged 13 to 15, where they're really accelerating quickly. And then as they get to uh, about two years of, of uh, growth remaining on average, 
um, that tends to slow down and they see uh, a less of an increase in growth over that time. And we can harness those expected phases of growth as we talk about how to avoid injury to the physis. Um, well, I think we're, we're all aware that not all uh, patients of the same age or of the same maturity level, and, it, and it's important when evaluating these kids to determine uh, exactly where they're at in their stage uh, in growth. Uh, you know, this can be done with the, the Tanner staging, looking at the secondary sexual characteristics, but it can also be done by x-ray, and this is what we routinely get to, um, to assess for how much growth these kids have remaining where we take an X-ray of the left hand and we compare uh, the little growth plates around the hand um, to controls either in this atlas or based on the expected age of closure of each of these growth plates uh, to determine their skeletal age rather than relying on simply the chronological age. Um, the reason why this is, a, is an issue, as you can see with the uh, image on the, uh, the right here, uh, comparing it to our uh, youngest adolescent uh, uh, example, uh, where our typical adult ACL reconstruction really does put these physes at risk. You can see the uh, metal interference screws going what would have been right across uh, the physis in this young girl. Um, uh, current rates of, uh, uh, of limb length discrepancy is about 3% of ACL reconstructions in, in uh, adolescents and angular deformity of 1.6%. And I think that uh, with the appropriate use of the algorithm that I'll uh, discuss later, uh, we can make that even better. Um, things that, that we worry about, not just uh, not just overall leg length, because it would be unlikely to, to shut down the um, the entirety of the physis in, in kids with an ACL reconstruction, but really, really worry about injuring the lateral aspect of the distal femoral physis, inducing a valgus deformity or knock need. And then on the tibial side, we worry about the anterior physis um, going into extension or recurvatum. Um, when it comes to, uh, to ACL surgeries, uh, as we'll see, about 80% of the, the, those gro growth disturbances are on the femoral side, um, really due to the close proximity of the femoral ACL insertion to the growth plate. You can see over, over time from, uh, from birth to age 15, that growth plate's really never more than a few millimeters away from our ACL insertion. So it's what we have to, uh, to worry about and consider when we're performing surgeries on these. And even avoiding the growth plate entirely, like we'll see with one of these techniques, that over-the-top position is still uh, right immediately adjacent and posterior to the physis and, and over-vigorous uh, manipulation there can, um, uh, can injure what's, uh, the perichondral ring in that area. Um, so ways that uh, that we can modify our surgical techniques from uh, from the typical adult style reconstruction is, are avoiding these things, uh, avoiding implants that go across the physis like these metal screws that you see here. Um, this particular patient had a patellar tendon uh, graft, which would also place the bone plugs from the patellar tendon graft across the physis, creating a bar. Larger tunnels over 12 millimeters would uh, would um, injury a substantial portion of the physis, uh, and as well as disrupt disruption of that perichondral ring that we just discussed in the over-the-top position. So what are our treatment options when it comes to kids? Um, like, uh, like we discussed in these cases, uh, we've got four different uh, children at, at four different stages of skeletal maturity, and we'll discuss uh, tre treatment options for each Ideal surgical treatment in kids, we want to be able to adequately restore knee stability in the biomechanics. That's the reason why we're here, the reason why we're doing the surgery to, to prevent the, the ACL deficient knee. We want to reduce the risk of that uh, injury to the physis, but also have a high rate of returning these kids to the activities that they're enjoying doing and having a low rate of complications. So this is a, a nicely laid out treatment algorithm uh, that was published in the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery a few years ago. Um, I think it's, it's nice to frame our discussion going forward, but note that this, uh, this does significantly change surgeon to surgeon um, based on their, their training in, uh, um, in areas of expertise, especially when we get into the discussion of uh, using the IT band uh, uh, procedure versus the all ACL reconstruction. So, uh, so getting back to our first case, our um, significantly skeletally mature prepubescent uh, eight-year-old female playing soccer um, with x-rays that look like this. Based on our algorithm, we kind of come down the left-hand side here and we can talk about things like 
uh, like activity modification and bracing. The patient uh, family comes in and asks, you know, do we really need surgery? Um, well, the, the answer is potentially. This was uh, historically um, uh, a treatment of choice uh, that we attempted to mitigate the risks of surgery in these patients uh, by avoiding surgery until the vices were completely closed. And you can do that either definitively if they do well without an ACL or say, hey, come back when your, when your growth plates are closed, and then we can do surgery. There were some studies that showed uh, um, decent results in this, um, and I'll highlight this 2004 study by Woods et al. Um, I think it's telling in their discussion that they say, we impose an immediate and absolute restriction on vigorous team sports activity. And they go on to say, if the patient and parents are unwilling to adhere to this temporary restriction, uh, the likelihood of incurring additional knee injuries is very high. I don't know about you, but there's not many eight-year-olds that we can put an immediate and absolute restriction on vigorous activities, team or otherwise. Uh, they're going to they're going to continue to stress their their knee, uh, whether we like it or not. Um, more typical of the the types of re results that we see with non-operative management are um, uh, an overwhelming majority of patients that are unable to return to their previous level of sports, and if they do, they continue to have ex uh, uh, instability episodes. Um, with a significant rate of uh, further damage to the other structures of the knee, the meniscus and cartilage that we worry about. I think the, the kind of the final nail in the coffin in non-operative management was this nice meta-analysis that they did um, out of Philadelphia a few years back that showed um, a significantly higher uh, rate of post-treatment instability in these patients uh, with non-operative treatment, almost a 10 times uh, rate of uh, subsequent meniscus tears, uh, horrible rates of return to play, and lower patient reported outcomes. So um, I, I would argue that uh, although it is an option, it's, uh, it's certainly not ideal and I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so you go through all those uh, 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 scenarios with the family, you tell them about the high rate of not only um, uh, uh, not being able to get back on the soccer field, but also that she could continue to trash her knee and the, and the family, well, we don't want to go for that. Our, our little girl's got to get back on the soccer field. So um, so the other option in these really young prepubescent patients is uh, is what we call the intraarticular extraficeal ACL reconstruction. Um, a mouthful, I know we typically call that the, the iliotibial band technique or the McKaylee technique. Dr. McKaylee here, my, uh, my fellowship mentor from, uh, from Boston Children's Hospital, first uh, performed the surgery back in the late 70s. Um, initially was uh, uh, patient number one here uh, was a three-year-old male, had congenital absence of his ACL, um, much too small to, to even think about drilling tunnels across. Um, he performed a modification of what was called the McIntosh procedure, which was a, a lateral extra-articular tendinitis that's since fallen out of favor um, and really only talked about in, uh, in this context these days. Um, he modified it by... Uh, using arthroscopic assistance to, to uh, uh, guide placement of the graft, um, passing the graft over the over the top position through the notch and, uh, and using a combined intra and extra articular reconstruction. Uh, initially when he uh, performed this, the idea was that this was gonna be just a temporizing procedure until the, the kid reached skeletal maturity, uh, better than treating it non-operatively, giving him some sort of support. Uh, but he found as he went along that these kids were able to continue to maintain their stability um, throughout adulthood and very rarely came back asking for that second surgery. Uh, in fact, his first patient, this three-year-old male, went on to play lacrosse in the Ivy League um, and became a recreational skier uh, in his adulthood. So certainly uh, good, uh, good uh, long-term results on the, those first couple of patients. Um, he continued to expand his indications over time, and they published their first series in the late 90s, and they're still uh, continuing to uh, to report uh, results and uh, and do this uh, procedure in higher higher numbers um, even today. So this is a, a schematic of the the IT band technique where the, we take a, a slip of the iliotibial band as a graft, leave it attached distally on the tibia, and wrap around the over the top position through the notch, reconstructing both the intraarticular portion of the ACL and the extra articular portion. And this is what it looks like at the time of surgery. It's obviously a very young patient based on the, the size of the, the surgeon's hands here, but a, a strip of the IT band um, is uh, uh, sectioned and detached proximally, leaving it attached distally at the tibia. 
Uh, then going in with the scopes, you can see a large clamp is placed through the, uh, the, the knee, out the, the posterior lateral aspect of the knee, and then the graft is drawn back in and under the intermeniscal ligament in the front. Um, the, that graft is then brought out through the tibia and then tied down through periosteal sleeves. Uh, again, creating your both your extra-articular and your intra-articular ACL um, sections uh, for this particular procedure. Um, outcomes uh, have generally been good, uh, although I, I will say um, all of the, the research thus far, um, all of the publications have been retrospective, and mo the majority of patients have been out of uh, Boston, although there have been a few other se smaller series from other institutions. Um, no significant strength uh, deficits are induced uh, at six months. No difference in long-term kinematics with a high rate of return to, to sports and a high rate of patient-reported uh, outcomes. Complications, um, a relatively low rate of, uh, of graft re-rupture. Like I said, the majority of these patients uh, do well into adulthood without requiring a secondary procedure. One thing to note and tell the patients about with this is you are taking a portion of the IT band and leaving a bit of a defect so they can see an outpooching of that vastus lateralis musculature. It's noticeable if you're looking for it, but very few patients um, say it becomes a problem. Um, and, uh, and overall, no, no reported cases of leg length discrepancy or angular deformity uh, have been reported in the literature. Even, even doing this on patients as young as, uh, as four years old was the youngest that I did in my fellowship. So certainly a lot of time remaining to, to develop these uh, if, uh, if they were going to. So pros of the IT band technique uh, that we use in our youngest patients, no violation of the physis because we're not drilling any tunnels, although we are getting close to the perichondral ring posteriorly. Um, no tunnels, we leave the typical ACL grafts in place. If the patient does need a revision surgery, all options are still on the table. And uh, in, a like, uh, in a similar vein, we're not uh, disrupting any of the major muscle groups of the lower extremity, inducing strength deficits um, that I'm sure we'll hear about in the next lecture on return to sports after uh, ACL reconstruction. Um, it do also includes the extra articular portion of the IT band graft, which we're um, in adults are, are learning is becoming uh, important in, uh, in rotational stability of the knee. Uh, and some surgeons are um, actually using just a small strip of the IT band in an extra articular fashion, even with their adult style reconstructions. Uh, knocks against it, like we mentioned, was the, the potential disruption of the perichondral ring. Um, it is a, a quote unquote non anatomic graft position, although I would contend that um, if you wanted to air one way or another with your femoral tunnel, you would want to push that back. Uh, the most common uh, malposition of that femoral tunnel is going to be anterior, and this, uh, this reconstruction certainly gets it posterior to, to provide that intraarticular stability. Um, the, one of the biggest concern for me is that size is limited by the width of the IT band. We would frequently, even in our patients uh, approaching skeletal maturity, would only get six and a half to seven millimeter diameter graphs. Um, and it, that's difficult to augment, um, uh, but not impossible. Um, and then a potential uh, con is the cosmetic deformity with the outpooching of the lateral thigh into the defect of the IT band. Um, so you discuss those uh, uh, the options, the pros and cons. And this uh, this family, this nice uh, eight-year-old girl, will opt to go for the IT band. Post-operative X-rays look like this because there's no hardware and no tunnels, um, so we don't see any post-operative change in her knee X-rays. Moving on, our 10-year-old male, our uh, little league baseball athlete. He's uh, uh, considerably bigger than our uh, our young soccer player. Uh, Fices are still wide open, still has a lot of growth left remaining. Uh, on average, uh, males grow to about the age of 16, and his skeletal maturity is consistent with that. So a lot of growth left remaining, um, but certainly bigger uh, than our last girl. Um, going down the uh, our ACL algorithm here, um, this is really the ideal patient for what's called the all-epiphyseal ACL reconstruction. Although, again, like I said, there is some de debate among surgeons um, where my mentors would, uh, would continue the, the indications for the uh, McKaylee technique um, uh, through this age group. This is where many surgeons will begin introducing the all epiphyseal technique if that's what they were trained in. So the all ACL reconstruction was first described in the literature in the early 2000s by Dr. Anderson down in Tennessee. Um, the, uh, he used anatomic footprints of the ACL to draw mo uh, drill modified tunnels to avoid the, the physis. 
Um, and he initially used a hamstring graft that was tied over a post screw uh, distal to the tibial physis and the metaphysis. And this was modified by the, the folks in Philadelphia who um, included all epiphyseal fixation on the tibial side as well in a very short uh, tibial tunnel. Um, a, a note that uh, there is some uh, overplay with this. Some surgeons will uh, will drill a transficeal tibial tunnel, and we'll talk about transficeal tunnel uh, drilling next, uh, but continue to use that all epiphyseal tunnel on the femoral side, which, as we said earlier, was the, the more concerning of the two growth plates. Um, so this is a schematic of the all epiphyseal tunnel drilling technique. As you can see, the femoral tunnel uh, is drilled staying completely distal to the physis and avoiding crossing the physis. And same with that tibial tunnel, although the tibial tunnel can be variable. Um, this is what it looks like in the knee, where, uh, where after debridement of the ACL stump, you uh, pick your uh, anatomic uh, uh, aperture on the femur and can use fluoroscopy to confirm that you're staying distal to the growth plate that you see here. Uh, a, a guide wire uh, can be drilled across um, with a either full length tunnel or um, if you prefer or facile with those techniques, they do have uh, uh, retrograde reamers um, to drill a, a partial um, distance tunnel as well. But again, uh, ensuring that you're staying distal to the, to the growth plate. Um, and that looks a little something like this. Uh, and this is what it looks like postoperatively. And this is a patient that did in fact have a transficeal tibial tunnel with a post screw here distally. But you can see that, that the tunnel and fixation are well distal and well away from the, uh, um, the uh, uh, distal femoral physis there. Um, the question is, is it safe? Do we have enough real estate to, to, to drill a tunnel staying within the epiphysis? And this uh, nice study out of Atlanta did show that um, uh, eight millimeter tunnels were, uh, at least there was enough room for them in patients as young as six years old. Uh, I think that personally, I think that is a little bit young. You're pushing it, uh, the indications for, uh, for the all epiphyseal technique, but they, uh, assure us that there is room. Um, and typically you're able to drill tunnels of 25 to 30 millimeters in length, which is, uh, plenty of distance to get good, uh, tendon to bone, uh, healing within your tunnel. Uh, they also show that you, the, this, uh, these tunnels can reliably be drilled uh, using bony landmarks um, so to limit the amount of x-ray exposure to these patients at the time of surgery. Uh, outcomes have generally been favorable for this, uh, although you'll, you'll note the, uh, these procedures at, at most have been around for, um, for about the last 20 years. Um, uh, all of the patients in, in Dr. Anderson's technique were, were able to return to activities with very low rates of uh, recurrent instability and high patient reported outcomes. Um, uh, similar to the folks at, at uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, high rates of return to sports, low graft failure rates, and low rates of instability. Um, and in these two series, uh, no rates of, uh, of limb length or angular deformity. Um, uh, one, one key point to discuss about these uh, uh, the literature thus far in uh, pediatric ACL reconstruction, as, as, as you've seen, most of the, the studies that are out there are uh, case series with no uh, real comparative cohorts. Um, the, the one that I know of uh, is this study that uh, it was uh, done out of the same folks at uh, Hospital for Special Surgery that was published last year, um, where they looked at three different age groups of, uh, of pediatric ACL patients and compared their outcomes. Um, this is not a center that heavily uh, does the McKaylee technique, but we'll, uh, we'll discuss this study and their findings for the, 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 the remaining three here. So group one, we're, uh, we're like our, uh, our baseball player here. Uh, average skeletal age was 12 years old, and they used the, the all epiphyseal of reconstruction with the hamstring autograft. Group two patients were a little bit older, uh, a little bit bigger. They underwent either complete or partial transficeal uh, ACL reconstruction that we'll talk about next. And then group three was the skeletally mature, but still under the age of, uh, of 18 uh, group that underwent adult style uh, reconstruction with patellar tendon autograph. Um, this study was nice in that they had two year follow ups, a relatively long term, although. Um, uh, that's not exactly the longest term in our pediatric patients. These 12-year-olds are still only 14 at two years and have a lot of competitive athletics left, um, but it's, uh, it's pretty good as far as orthopedic literature goes. Um, and they were able to compare rates of return to play and subsequent surgeries amongst groups. So what did they find for this group uh, with our, uh, our adolescent baseball player? Uh, they were able to show 100% rate of return to sports with their 
um, all epiphyseal technique, 92% were able to get back to the same level of play. Only 6% revision ACL, which is similar to the, the McKaylee technique that we just talked about. Uh, a little bit higher the contralateral side, um, and only a 14% rate of ipsilateral uh, surgery on the, on that side. Um, so overall, uh, showing good uh, good results with their uh, their cohort of patients undergoing all epiphyseal ACL uh, reconstruction. Uh, pros of the all epiphyseal technique in these uh, these patients is that it is a, a, a quote unquote anatomic technique. You can place the, those uh, tunnels intraarticularly right at the footprints where you, where your normal ACL sits. Um, and when positioned correctly, the, these tunnels don't violate the physis um, as long as you stay in the epiphysis and don't get too close. Um, con to this technique is it does require adequate bone stock. So in our really young patients, like that uh, little soccer uh, girl, she may not have had enough um, a space in her epiphysis to be able to get a, a typical eight millimeter ACL tunnel. Um, and, uh, and another con is that the re revisions just tend to be a little bit more difficult than, uh, than that IT band technique, uh, whereas, uh, where this, uh, you still have to work around a, a previously drilled tunnel and you have fewer graft options left at the time of revision if you need it. Uh, so you discuss the, the, those with, uh, um, our 10 year old male's parents here. Um, and they opt for this uh, all epiphyseal technique uh, that's seen here. Moving on, our 14-year-old male, our offensive lineman who went down during a, the, during a football game, he's coming in. He's obviously bigger than our 10-year-old male. Uh, growth plates are almost closed, but still, still open, still has a couple more years of growth remaining. Um, so where does that fit in our, on our, uh, our algorithm here? He's, uh, it nicely would fit into our, uh, what we call the physeal respecting trans physeal ACL reconstruction. Um, so this is a, a, a technique that's most similar to the adult style ACL reconstruction technique that, uh, that adult surgeons are, uh, would be familiar with. Um, and the goal of this uh, technique is to limit the area of physeal injury by um, altering the trajectory of the tunnel that you're drilling by placing a soft tissue graft uh, across the, the growth plate and to put your fixation away from the growth plate as well. So this is a schematic of what that looks like. You can see these tunnels are, uh, are now crossing the growth plates on either side, uh, but you've got a nice soft tissue graft, either hamstring or quadriceps tendon is a, is a good option as well uh, with fixation on the cortex or, or an interference screw, both stopping well short of the growth plate. Um, and this is what this looks like intraarticularly. Again, a pick used to uh, to find your anatomic uh, femoral insertion, nice and posterior with the with the back of the femoral condyle there. Uh, this particular surgeon is using a flexible uh, um, anteromedial portal reaming system, although um, this can be performed with any a typical adult style reconstruction with a, a, a rigid anteromedial portal, a transtibial re, um, drilling or or even outside in with a with a retro reamer type device. Uh, the, the tunnel after it's drilled looks uh, hopefully looks like this. You can see uh, the the tan bone with the uh, pearly white soft tissue of the growth plate that's nice and circular that we've crossed as perpendicular as possible. The more um, the more diagonal you are to the, the to the growth plate, the more this will be the circle will be oblong in the higher area of the growth plate that you've interfered with. And this is what a typical patient looks like uh, um, at a year out after surgery. You can see our cortical button here away from the growth plate tunnels that have crossed the growth plate, although um, uh, at relatively perpendicular. Uh, with a, You can see the shadow of a bioabsorbable interference screw here stopping well short of the growth plate. And after a year, this patient's seen no significant um, leg length or alignment changes. Um, so, you know, the, the question with this is, is, is it safe to drill across the physis? We know that in animal models going back to the 1950s, uh, we can uh, limit the, the growth disturbance to the growth plate by using a, a smaller diameter tunnel placed in the more central portion of the physis. Um, and, uh, and with regards to our trans uh, drilling techniques, uh, we know that the typical technique for drilling an eight millimeter tunnel violates less than 4% of the physis, um, although that is negatively correlated with the tunnel angle. Like I said, the more oblique you are to the, the physis, the, the larger the, the area that you injure. Um, so recommended modifications is drilling a more vertical tunnel. This is a, an example of what the cross section would be with an oblique tunnel. 
versus a, a per perfectly perpendicular tunnel, you can see a much smaller cross-sectional area of the physis is injured. Placing it more in the center will, will, would prevent uh, and, uh, the angular deformity that, that we're worried about, like on this tibia, the, uh, a more anterior portion, uh, more anterior tunnel, we would worry about that reach or bottom deformity. And then keeping your hardware well away from the physis, like these post screws that have been drilled here. There's some uh, some surgeons that will also stop the the um, power drill and drill across the physis by hand, um, as you know, worrying about the thermal necrosis that can happen at the physis. Although that's not uh, not always the case. Um, as far as outcomes of uh, of this, so we've had um, this is the technique that has the longest uh, uh, duration in the literature. Um, going back for uh, for several decades, uh, high rates of return to play with relatively low rates of, uh, of return and stability, certainly much lower than, uh, than the non-operative treatment, but overall a relatively high rate of, of complications, which is uh, higher than our, our physeal sparing techniques. Um, graft failure is relatively low, under, uh, under 10%, which is pretty darn good, um, with, uh, it, with no significant difference from our physeal sparing techniques. Um, one, uh, uh, one comment on the complications is that uh, up to two-thirds of the reported cases of limb shortening or valgus malalignment that are in the literature have come from transficeal reconstruction techniques. Uh, one article um, ordered post-operative MRIs on a series of these patients and showed a 12% rate of bone bridge, although in many of these patients that ends up being uh, clinically insignificant as they don't develop these, but still something to worry about. Um, even in a well-done uh, transficeal reconstruction, we can get some, uh, uh, some bridge across that, uh, that physis. So going back to that comparative study out of New York, um, this, uh, it goes, um, this uh, physeal respecting transficeal group was group two in their study. Um, and showed significantly lower rates of return to sports at only 85%. Um, yeah, but most alarming was a 20% uh, revision ACL reconstruction rate led by a 24% rate in females. Um, they had a 17% contralateral ACL, which was also higher than their, their group one, um, and actually a little bit lower rate of other ipsilateral knee surgeries. Um, you know, I, I, the, the difficult thing about uh, this study is also, um, uh, while they are comparing uh, techniques, they're comparing a, a apples to oranges across different age groups. And I think this group two is really one that's tough. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see in the next lecture on return to sports, but this is really the group, those 14 year olds, they're significantly skeletally immature. That's why we're, uh, we're talking about these uh, modifications to their ACL techniques, but they're potentially playing varsity high school athletics against fully grown 18 year olds. Um, so I think that there's more of a pressure for them to get back faster and sooner, but they're also playing at a higher level than they have before. Um, and so I think that that certainly has a lot to do with the, the high rate of revision ACLs, but certainly this study shows that uh, uh, that we've got work to do with this technique. Um, and listening to the uh, surgeons from this group that published this, they have altered their technique both um, with their choice and graft in this group. They've gone to using the quadriceps tendon instead of the hamstring tendons um, and also adding um, one of those extra articular uh, procedures that we talked about with, uh, with the IT band procedure to this to try to, to lower this rate down. So we'll see if they're able to successfully um, reduce their rate of revision ACL in this group. Pros of, uh, of the, uh, this technique, the, the transficeal reconstruction, is that, it, uh, again, like the all epiphyseal, is it's an anatomic reconstruction. You can put those tunnels exactly where you want them. Uh, this technique is one that's most familiar to the adult surgeons. It requires just a minimal modification to, to the technique that they're already using. Um, and this is the one that has the longest follow-up data available. Cons is that it's the, this is the one technique that we've talked about so far that does cross the growth plate um, and a higher, it does have a higher rate of reported complications in the literature. Although um, I think a lot of those happen before we really optimize the rest of these uh, techniques that we're talking about today um, and highlighted the need for, uh, for uh, modified techniques that we've come up with since then. Um, so, you, um, so getting back to our 14 year old male football player, um, he gets this uh, transficeal technique. 
uh, with a hamstring autograft in this case, although there's, uh, like you said, there's a case to be made for other soft tissue grafts or other augmentation procedures to try to get this kid um, stable in the long run. And then finally, our last uh, case that we uh, that I presented at the beginning, our 16-year-old female uh, high school basketball athlete. You can see in her uh, knee that she's skeletally much sure those physes are closed and she's done growing. So on our uh, treatment algorithm, she's a prime candidate for your typical adult style transphyseal, um, uh, so to speak, ACL reconstruction using whatever uh, graft fixation uh, and drilling technique you're most comfortable with. Um, getting back to that uh, uh, hospital for special surgery study, um, this is the, the group three where they were skeletally mature uh, pediatric patients, but um, uh, using the patellar tendon autograft technique, and uh, they they were able to get back to rates of return to sport and uh, subsequent surgery and retear rates similar to group one. Um, so, like I said, there's something uh, there's something about this group two that we haven't quite figured out yet. Uh, it may be our drilling technique. It may be the uh, the realities of getting these kids back to play. But certainly, once they become skeletally mature, that uh, those factors seem to drop away a little bit. Um, so, uh, so again, our 16 year old female, she gets a, uh, our typical adult style in this case, due to the, um, the high rate of, uh, of re-injury in our, uh, our adolescent, uh, female basketball players, we go with the tried and the true, uh, patellar tendon autograft with bone plugs and, and metal screw fixation, like you see here. Um, so one, uh, one further, uh, study to, uh, to highlight, um, based on the, uh, like we've uh, we've talked about the uh, pretty low quality of research so far in this area. Um, the uh, folks uh, that I trained with in Boston Children and, and other sites around the country that do a lot of these pediatric ACL techniques have started and actually finished enrollment in this uh, multi-center prospective observational study that they're calling Pluto, uh, of course, with the cartoon character for our kids. Um, this is analogous to the, the moon studies in the adult ACL literature where it's a, a prospective multicenter trial. They finished enrollment uh, right before um, the pandemic hit. So luckily they were able to wrap that up uh, with, uh, with uh, several hundred patients in these, uh, in these cohorts across the country. Um, and they'll be able to, to give us a 10 year follow up um, comparing uh, multiple techniques. So this is where we'll be able to really answer the question of these borderline groups. Should we be doing uh, the Michaeli IT band versus the all epiphyseal techniques? What about the all epiphyseal versus the transphyseal and our kids that are getting close? Which graft is better hamstrings or quad in our in our kids? All these questions I think are potentially answered by this uh, this study, although there's no publications yet. I would expect at least their their baseline data or uh, or demographic studies to come out here over the next year or two. So um, so we'll uh, we'll wait with bated breath to see if we can't get better guidance on what type of, uh, of surgical procedures to be performing in these kids. Uh, so in conclusion uh, of my talk here, uh, I think we've we've shown today that uh, that in spite of four uh, typical patients that come across our pediatric. Uh, clinics, they've all got uh, the same injury, but I think that we should be aware that there are significant differences between all of them, and there's no one cookie-cutter procedure or technique that's, uh, that's good for everyone, and, uh, and I think the surgeon that's treating these ACL uh, injuries in these kids should have uh, a, a, a varied toolbox of, uh, of tools to be able to take care of these patients. Um, and just a, a reminder of, of all the different options that we talked about. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for having me, and I'll open the floor to any other questions that, that may have come up.